Hi, I'm Greg. I'm the lead singer for Lipstick Generation. And I'm Steve. I'm the bassist. And or maybe the guitarist now? Who knows? Who knows? Greg, and maybe you're the bassist. I might be the bassist. Who knows? And today on the Lifted panel, we are celebrating St. Patrick's Day with a Thin Lizzy episode because we are basic as fuck on this show. Yeah, and because, you know, at this point, it's tradition. This is what, like, the third Thin Lizzy episode for St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, and we, you know, we've done a, I think we've done a couple others not on St. Patrick's Day because I sincerely love the band and they bring me a lot of joy in my life. And hey, speaking of people who love the band and whose, you know, music brings joy into their lives, we've got Chris Lathrop from Pot of Thunder joining us on the show, another big Thin Lizzy fan. Welcome back, Chris. Happy to be on here. Uh, favorite li uh, Thin Lizzy album of all time. So Did you say I Limp Bizkit? Resist the invite. Did Limp Bizkit cover this album in entirety? No, that's uh, for the good of all humanity. <laughs> they did not do that, thank God. Uh, don't believe a word I say! Did I almost say Limp Bizkit? Is I think you, you started saying Lizzie, and then you caught yourself with an M sound. Yeah, yeah maybe, a, hopefully not a Freudian slip. But, yeah. uh, hopefully yeah. not a prophecy. I mean, it's, Come it's on, a Bizkit, announce the re-recording <laughs> the Lizzie discography on St. <laughs> Patty's this year. I mean, look, it's St. Patrick's, the, the liquor is flowing throughout the panel. Even those of us who don't drink will be drunk by the end of this episode. Uh, speaking of people experiencing the effects of alcohol, uh, Mr. <laughs> Victor Krause hung over for this episode like a true champ. Welcome to the show, Victor. Hey, thanks for doing this an hour later, even though I didn't know I was going to be getting that drunk last night. <laughs> he's he's pre-gaming for our St. Patrick's episode over a month in advance. <laughs> we, it is, in fact, the day the of the big game, rather than St. Patrick's Day when we're recording this episode. But that's how committed he is to the art. I so just I just wanted to be true. <laughs> Yeah, and, we're, and we aren't starting an hour late because, you know, Steve was out of town and had to have time to listen to the album. No, that's certainly not why we're starting an hour late. It's because we were respecting Victor's commitment to the craft. Mm -hmm. so, and I appreciate that. I drove 13 <laughs> hours yesterday from Florida, which was plenty of time to listen to this album on a repeat. But you were listening to The Silmarillion instead because yes. you're a nerd. And a random, like, ebook called Junkyard Cats that Amazon was like, please don't cancel your Audible subscription. This is free. I canceled my Audible subscription regardless. So plowing right past that, <laughs> that reference that none of us understood, we're going to go uh, around This the is a podcast, Greg. Everybody knows what Audible is. Well, no, right, but they don't know that particular book. I don't think it matters. It's just some random book. All right. But yeah, Audible, uh, great service. Uh, this podcast brought to you by Audible. I wish. <laughs> So uh, we have integrity. <laughs> we only advertise services that come to mind that we want to mention. <laughs> so Ferraris. So typically we begin our episodes by going around the panel and talk about our history with the, the subject at hand, which in this case would be Thin Lizzy's Johnny the Fox album. Uh, I want to start with Chris, since this is his favorite Thin Lizzy album. Uh, I want to go in order of how much I suspect people love the album. So I will go... Uh, after Chris, and uh, then um, Steve, and then uh, Victor, because uh, Victor, this is his first Lizzie episode, so he's the anomaly, so I'm going to have him go last, but Chris, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about your history with this album and why you love it so much. Um, just kind of, uh, you know, you typically when you um, discover the band, it's via the jailbreak tunes, and um, then you might delve into that album as a whole um which is true of me and then um you start exploring other albums and then so this one came on my radar and um just one that hooked me instantly and um pretty much uh the fighting jailbreak johnny the fox and bad reputation are pretty much on um, essentially equal footing for me they're all outstanding can't think of a track on any of them that i don't like but um this one stands out for me uh slightly above the others and um i'll get into why as we start uh analyzing the tracks yeah and um i'll go ahead and go next so i discovered the band through the I mean, I knew the boys are back in town and jailbreak the songs, but I really discovered them through the the dedication single and that greatest hit CD. That was my introduction to the band. So 
the only song from this album I was familiar with before listening to the entire album was the single Don't Believe a Word. But this was actually the first full-length studio album I purchased by the band. My uh, high school bassist and I, we would coordinate our music purchases together because it was the age of CDs and would rip each other CDs because we were broke teenagers. So he bought Jailbreak and I bought Johnny the Fox. But I bought Johnny the Fox before he bought he bought Jailbreak. So that was the first Lizzie album that we listened to together. And, you know, going through the entire catalog, I, this one I have some mixed feelings on where I still love it and I think it's a masterpiece. But I probably rank it fourth from the bottom in the overall catalog of all Lizzie albums. I think it's uh, definitely better than the first two. And I think it has a better ebb and flow than Nightlife. Uh, but... And it also, you know, the rankings change based upon my mood. But generally, I rank this towards the bottom of the classic era. But the bottom of classic era, Thin Lizzy, is still one of the greatest albums of all time. So I'm a little bit conflicted on, on some of it, where I'm like, oh, I wish this was a little bit stronger. Where it's most Thin Lizzy, like, blows me away. And this is just really excellent, most of it. And there's only, like five songs that are blowing me away as opposed to every single song blowing me away. It's like five mind blowing, amazing songs. And then the rest are like, yeah, this is still really good, but it's not blowing my mind as much. So still love it, but it's not quite uh, the top tier of Lizzie for me, at least some of the cuts. Uh, so Steve, how about you? You're the resident uh, Nets person with the most expertise in Thin Lizzie in this group. Sorry, Greg, just give me a second. I'm grabbing a piece of paper so I can make a note of the timestamp. For when Greg said most Thin Lizzy blows. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, well, we're gonna go to um, we're gonna go to Victor while while Steve mates that, so he can uh, <laughs> use that drop on later episodes. You know it. <laughs> um, well, I've waxed poetic on previous episodes about how much I know about Kiss, and. I think um, when it comes to Thin Lizzy, I might know 10 times as much. (laughs) 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 Um, uh, I I will say, so er, er, this week uh, when Greg asked me to do the episode, I was thinking on Thin Lizzy and I knew for sure that I knew two songs and I had actually recently listened to the episode about jailbreak the lipstick panel episode about jailbreak and i was like okay so i for sure know jailbreak and boys are back in town and then greg also had me listen to his episode of decibel geek that he was on talking about thin lizzie and i only got about halfway through it i was going to finish it last night but there somebody put a lot of rum in my glass and kept putting it there after it was gone and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> but I I got up to the point where they talked about bad reputation, and I was like, "Oh, there is another song by them that I know." <laughs> and somebody played so, Guitar Hero. I sure did. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I know three songs by them, but now I know thirteen songs by them. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what did you what did you think overall about the album? Just general thoughts before we get into the ranking. Are, are you I surprised think, that I like this band? No, not at all. I um, I I think the thing I'm right now most curious about. So this is I think I've been on this show a million times, and only twice have you ever told me I wasn't full of, or have you ever not told me I was full of shit. But okay, and this was one of them, and I suspect it's because I was drunk when I sent my rankings and you weren't even awake, so. (laughs) Um. (laughs) You are correct, because, yes, you are absolutely full of shit. (laughs) So much so on this ranking, perhaps more than you've ever been. Okay, see, that was the thing I wanted to know, is like, so are my rankings, like, are they completely out of line here? I have no idea, and I usually have some indication, because we usually talk more through the week, and we just didn't happen to this week, um, because I I didn't have as much time to listen to the album as I normally would for an episode of the show. But I think overall, I like it. Um, There's, I think, only one track that I'm overall negative on 
and then there's a couple that I'm neutral on, and the rest are either good or great or fantastic. And Steve, how about you? Uh, so I've this is probably the Thin Lizzy album that I've listened to the most times. In that, uh, you know, at any given time, Greg has this album and or Jailbreak in his car and or um the live one. And uh, this is the one that I was like, oh, this is kind of like a concept album. I like rock operas. So this would be the one that I was most inclined to, you know, while riding with Greg somewhere, say, oh, let's just toss this one on. Plus, I listened to it twice in preparation for this episode because a week ago uh, on Friday, when I normally listen to the album albums at work, uh, I listened to this album. And then I was like, oh, shoot, I'm going to be in Florida for a week. Uh, and then frantically listen to the album one more time before we record the episode. So, um, yeah, uh, I was vaguely familiar with it. Uh, for more notes on my overall fandom and familiarity with Thin Lizzy, go listen to our Jailbreak episode, as you should have anyway, uh, Lipstick Panel fans. Uh, but I guess you should, pr for, for those who just don't want to skip over immediately, uh, where would you say you are in terms of fandom of the band? I'd, I'd say oh, very casual. Okay. So I was first exposed to Thin Lizzy through Basic Bro Rock Radio, uh, where I heard the same popular songs that everybody else did, and then I was exposed to more Thin Lizzy by Greg. Um, and, you know, they're they're one of those bands that uh, I probably, they're a little more, I'm a little more neutral towards them than, say, Kiss. Like, they have, uh, their highs aren't quite as high. There's no crazy, crazy nights in the in the Thin Lizzy discography, nor are there any I Was Made For Loving Yous, but there also aren't any Christine Sixteens. So the the lows aren't quite as low. They're much more, I'm less likely to be annoyed by them. Uh, but they don't have a black diamond. All right, so there we go. A, a diversity of opinions on this panel. But yeah, let's let's jump straight into the ranking. So coming in as the least best song on Thin Lizzy's Johnny the Fox, we have a Boogie Woogie Dance coming in at the bottom. Greg, you hated this song. Why? So I don't, I don't hate it. There's not a song on this album that I hate or even think is bad. There's just a few songs, and they and they mostly came at the bottom of this ranking, where they're not at the same like standard of excellence I usually want Thin Lizzy songs to be. Where like they're still very good, very competent, very enjoyable, but they're not getting as much of a visceral reaction from me. And so Boogie Woogie Dance, when I was a teenager, I actually didn't really care for this song much. For me, it in some ways was sort of the boomerang of the of the Thin Lizzy catalog, Ooh. where it's like we're going to close out this album with a song that's um, kind of silly lyrically. Um, Great. Now we're going to be here all damn day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to go too long into into a boomerang thing uh, because this is a much better song than boomerang. Uh, but it, because it was just closing out with just like a really like energetic rock song, not very melodic and just all about like the riffs, but unlike Boomerang, this is a good riff. Uh, it does have this like pummeling energy and I've, I, you know, at this point in my life, I do love the song. It's just, it's, there are other Thin Lizzy songs that do like intense syncopated rhythms, I think in, in a more interesting way than this song. So there are other Lizzie songs that do the same kind of things better with better lyrics on top of it. Uh, and I think if this song had um, maybe more aggressive, menacing lyrics and wasn't called Boogie Woogie Dance, like when I think, <laughs> when I think Boogie Woogie, you know, it's, it might be my perception. I'm thinking, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry and that old school rock and roll um, rhythm and bounce to it. And or this is, Oogie Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas. Or Oogie Boogie. But this is more like, um, you know, proto Metallica in its rhythms. And it's awesome. But there's, there's that disconnect between the lyrics and the music. But I still think it's very excellent. I like that breakdown section. Uh, and I think it's, it's overall a, a good piece, but there's just, you know, if I'm, if I'm ranking, you know, all the Thin Lizzy songs on like a master playlist, it comes towards the bottom, but it's still, it's still like an A, like there's nothing below an A on this album. It's just not most Thin Lizzy songs are like S plus. So when I was reading up on this album a little bit while doing my research, uh, I did see that some of the people involved in it, I forget exactly who sort of felt like some of the songs on this album were a little bit undercooked that like just fill the knot 
slapping them out while sitting in the hospital recovering from hepatitis and they they probably needed some some more revisions i guess i i I kind of said there's a few songs where i think they've like they transcend and are in that prime thin lizzy category but then there's songs like like this and the others that are at the bottom of the ranking that I feel are not quite there, unfortunately. So, uh, this, but it, this it's one still very good. Could have had some more cook time. Yes, it, it could have had some more cook time. And there's so many great Phil Lynott demos of unreleased songs that I think are better than Boogie Woogie Dance. So it's not that, um, you know, there's any shortage of excellent material coming from Phil Lynott. It's just this one, I think, you know, this one, there's certain songs on this album that feel like they were rushed out. And Thin Lizzy rushing stuff out is still better than most bands taking their damn sweet time, but it, it does feel a little bit rushed Tool. to me. No comment? <laughs> Hot takes! Ah, I'm insane with anger! Uh, Chris, what did you feel about this one? You put this right in the middle. Yeah, I had this uh, sixth of ten. Um, I'm with Greg, too. They're kind of... Uh, there's not a song I dislike. So, I mean, aside from the few toward the top, um, they could pretty much be interchangeable for me. Um, thing I like about this song is just got that kind of menacing decadent vibe to it. Like there's something, you know, really either sinister or fun or a combination of the two going on within this song. Um, and it kind of draws me in all the time. And then obviously that kind of tribal drum, drumming by Downey throughout is really, um, you know, something that uh, jumps out at me is really good at, at, in this tune. Um, you know, uh, it's the album closer. Maybe it was kind of tossed in as an afterthought. And I can understand why some people would think of it as filler, but uh, I'm still a fan of it. Uh, you know, for the stuff I mentioned earlier, there's just something about the lyrical content and the combination of the music that's like uh, really kind of kind of dirty and decadent. And that type of thing always tends to draw me in. Victor, you were not drawn in by this one. You ranked this second from the bottom. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of it, it feels like I, I like the riff. I even wrote in here before I realized that Thin Lizzy wrote the song Bad Reputation. I wrote, reminds me of Bad Reputation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I felt like the riffs don't really add up to a song. It's just like a bunch of stuff. And it's almost like another thing that I had a thought on just now while you guys were talking is like, it almost reminds me in terms of... Um, subject matter stacked against style it reminds me a little bit of like proto oingo boingo Mm. um but not (laughs) quite i do have in my notes danny elfman did it better yeah they would have called it the spooky wookie dance they would have (laughs) (laughs) and i would have loved that song very much uh I think Victor is lobbying for the nickname Interesting Take on this uh, panel. <laughs> interesting Takes. So definitely an interesting interesting observation. And I'm actually, now that I'm pondering it, it's making sense to me. So nice job on that. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Victor's Victor's brain works in mysterious and wonderful ways. <laughs> um, Mis- mysterious ways. That's another Irish band wrote that song. I listen to them. You too. Yeah, I I I I know. It was the band. <laughs> uh, uh, so I I used to have more the the thought that Victor has, where it's like it was just a bunch of riffs that didn't add up to a complete song. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've I've leaned more towards the the Chris direction on it. Uh, Steve, where do you come in on Boogie Woogie Dance? I actually ranked it the highest of everybody here. I put it fourth from the top. Um, he loves Oingo Boingo though. I, right, I I love Oingo Boingo mostly because I confuse them with Mr. Bungle. Um, but uh, they they this did have a pretty good riff. I wasn't super fond of the breakdown, and I think this one does succumb to the could have spent more time in the writing process in that the lyrics have a real place in France vibe to them. 
Uh, ultimately, I feel like Kesha did it better, and that's sort of my overall conclusion, but it's a decent song. Um, that's what I have to say. All right, I'm done talking so about Kesha. this great song. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, hold go on. Ahead. I got a question. I got a question about Kesha reference, yes. which is also I don't. I, Kesha I, covered "Place I'm in not, France" better than uh, "Thin Lizzy" is my intention. Yeah, I know that's what I, my question, and um, I'm not drunk, but the way I'm uh, latching on to some of these takes is making me feel like I'm <laughs> drunk because there's no explanation <laughs> for it. But, uh, <laughs> Chris was like, I'm not so going to drink, Kesha, but I'm going to go hang out with the lipstick panel and feel like I've been drinking. Yeah, living vicariously. No but, hangover uh, that so, way. So did Kesha kind of expand on the whole ladies have no pants vibe of the place in France lyricism? I, or? I believe she did it as there's a place downtown where the freaks all hang around. Literally, it was okay, to the place, in, really... the place in France melody. Uh, that is a thing that emerged within the last... This millennium is people just sample place in France in pop music sometimes. I did not know that. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm a fan of altering that lyric, but uh, I anyway, don't think it matters what my... you do with it because it's a children's rhyme. You can't mess you can't mess with the classics, man. I mean Kesha's, Kesha's flying too close to the sun here. Right? <laughs> you sometimes can. Like you can you can maybe pull off throwing in a little bit of ring around the rosy into like a metal song about death and disease. Yeah, that's that hasn't been done. I mean, million. it's definitely been done, but sometimes it can be pulled off, but like just throwing throwing like vulgar schoolyard rhymes into pop music is just like what are you what are you even doing? Yeah, what, what if people took vulgar schoolyard rhymes and then made them very wholesome? Right, I, I I just feel like there needs to be more songs which which include milk, milk, lemonade, turn around and fudge is made as a lyric. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that one. That's a good one. <laughs> I, the, I never emotionally point. matured past thirteen, so I remember it all. The, I remember everything. Point. Man, this brings back a lot of memories. Keep them to yourself, pops. The whole point of having France as the locale, though, is so you can follow it with the line, the ladies wear no pants. So I've I mean, usually I heard think, it as where the naked ladies the dance. Other. I mean, that's even anyway, better. Sorry for the high tech. And the men don't care because they have no underwear. All right. So I think we've. Uh, There's we've... a hole in the wall. <laughs> All right, so I, I think we've, we've beaten this joke into the ground. <laughs> Take that joke. <laughs> so uh, next up on the list is uh, we, we have the, the height of Victor's bullshit opinions on this episode. The number one song on Victor's list is next up in the ranking. Oh my god. <laughs> what? So Sweet Marie is next on the list. Victor? Wow. I mean, Victor, you were drunk. Not every t I listened to this album like five times. Uh, and you so were drunk every time? Only That's drunk dedication to the bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and one of those times was at work, so. <laughs> Don't you work at a liquor store? I do. That's why you were drunk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Sweet Marie, uh, second from the bottom on our list, but number one on Victor's number one in Victor's heart. I know yeah. that uh, it doesn't use very many chords, so that's something that's uh, appealing to Victor. And also, uh, there is <laughs> not any Joey hitting the drums on this track, so that's also appealing to Victor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two chords and no drums, I'm in! Uh, so, Victor, why don't you tell us why you love this track, other than uh, two chords and no drums? So, those, there's the two chords, but those chords, they're thick, they're juicy. And um, the uh, the uh, the melody that Phil is singing over it, I think, is like it's not just like him singing a couple of notes over some nice chords. He's singing a very pleasing melody on its own, and then pairing it with those chords is just uh, Chef's Kiss. I think I probably wrote three or four times in my notes here. Um, it it also the guitar solo on this. There's a lot of very impressive guitar solos on this album. And this is the only one that's not like absolutely trying to rip your face off with shredding. This one is really, 
it, it's so much more interested in kind of the flow and the rhythm of the song itself and playing with the like the harmonic structure and it's so beautiful and great and you guys don't understand thin lizzy like i do i feel like i feel like saying thin lizzy is trying to rip my face off with shredding in their solos is like the spiciest mayonnaise of takes <laughs> i i mean like so spicy you might have even put some black pepper into the mayonnaise rather than just salt and lemon <laughs> <laughs> yeah but this one isn't you're is like the they didn't put the pepper in just the right amount of salt and lemon Mwah, yeah, chef's kiss yeah but then they did it over them chords mm, mm, mama mama like and i'm mama apparently <laughs> Well, this is this is like uh, the the fruit at the bottom yogurt of takes. <laughs> really, really edgy. <laughs> this is this is the classy yogurt where they don't mention probiotics in the commercial, even if Jamie Lee Curtis is there. But there's still fruit at the bottom. Uh, but actually, I really appreciate that analysis, Victor. I think that was actually quite beautiful. This was a song that. You know, a high school Greg was not as into, but I've learned to appreciate over the years as I've just started listening to like more weird, like East Indian influenced music. Uh, so like the sitar stuff isn't striking me as weird as it did when I was younger. The melody makes more sense to me. Um, Why are you whining about sitar? The Beatles are your favorite band. Right. And it took and some of those songs. It took me a while to get into in comparison. Like, um, but I think this this track um like it, it's weird for me where this it crept up in my rankings a little bit. Where this used to be, um, you know, maybe the last place song on the album for me, but it ended up, you know, with my current mood ranking uh, fourth from the bottom. So it's it's a it's a great song. I do like the melody. I like the change of pace, and this is kind of a thing that Thin Lizzy never really did ad again. It, so it really stands out in their catalog, and a lot of these songs on this album. Like, they did once on this album and then never really revisited that style. So in that way, it's it's very cool. It's unique. And, uh, you know, I rank it lower in terms of their overall catalog of ballads because I think there's just so much, so many songs that just have stronger emotional pulls. There's so many better ballads on this album. Uh, I would say, I would say, yes, there are better ballads on this album. Um, but I, I, I enjoy it quite a bit, but... Um, I can, I can understand why this one, why I wasn't into it when I was younger, but I do like it a lot now. Uh, Chris, you put this last place. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on Sweet Marie? Yeah, uh, apologies to Victor, because so far I'm actually liking him for, again, and some inexplicable reason. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Again, I, I put this last because something had to go last, but I mean, I, I like the song. It's well done it's uh for for a ballad it's i i consider it to be one of their best and um you know i agree that the guitar solo is very nicely executed it, it would definitely be a gorham solo whereas uh robo tends to be a lot more aggressive and in your face um you know gorham brings that uh laid back socal vibe to the band and this would be one of his uh, his better efforts, um, and uh, no, I just there's nothing I don't like about it. It's just something that had to be last on my list. I tend to um, like all the other songs better, and um, and then I'll just close with uh, opining that um, you know Victor's observation of the chords being thick and juicy perhaps marie was also thick and juicy <laughs> oh. mm. tasty steve you love thick and juicy women how do you feel about sweet marie i'm gonna edit that part <laughs> <laughs> damn that's the first time i've done that to you yeah <laughs> Uh, <laughs> You're going to edit it out and not use it as a drop? <laughs> <laughs> we, we shall see. We <laughs> shall see. Uh, so um, I put this one second from the bottom just because you sort of go through the mental checklist of kind of a concept album, 
uh there's a nun involved sweet mary um yeah queen's reich did it better um I'm not much one for ballads usually. This one's on the boring side of ballads, and Queensryche's guitar solo on their ballad rips your face off. And also throws in sex noises? I don't know if I'm as big of a fan of that part of things, but, um... Look, I just have one joke. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's a it's a it's a ballad that Steve finds boring that he doesn't really remember too much what it sounds like. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. Yet another joke about death, perplexing some, and just plain scaring most. Of All right, well we'll just uh, plow past that and move on to next up in our ranking, Victor's least favorite song on the album. We've got Borderline go. next on the list. That is a. Uh, I, I love your rankings on this show because they're never anything close to what the panel comes up with. And just the, sh <laughs> the shock of where things end up in comparison to your ranking is always a joy. Like I always, I always take notes. I put the ranking number to the right uh, on my rankings, on my document, <laughs> so I can know. And so I can <laughs> be mad later. <laughs> He's just got, like, one of those boards with a bunch of, like, um, pieces of yarn or felt yarn connecting everything and, uh, like, a huge conspiracy theory of, all right, borderline, third from the bottom, what? Yeah, so I understand uh, Joey hits the drums too much on this, and that's why you don't like it. <laughs> uh, any other reasons why you don't like it other than too much drums? So, um, there's a lot of songs... Um, on this album that I feel very specifically are like super proto Metallica in the way that like specifically the guitars are arranged uh, with one main difference being the drumming in Thin Lizzy is a lot different from how Metallica is. I'm almost ready to make a value judgment and say, I like the drumming in Thin Lizzy more, but um, this so like Rocky, for example, feels very much like, okay, Metallica listened to this and jacked off a lot. And then, <laughs> But then I feel like this song is proto a lot of music I really don't like. Like, this feels like proto stained. I would still take this over. <laughs> it's been a while. Harsh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. As somebody who's literally had his salary paid by stained at times, you're not wrong. They, they do suck. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually say this is... Um... A proto hair metal in a lot of ways. This is a proto hair metal power ballad uh, in terms of the instrumentation and structure. Uh, you know, if you think of where, you know, Motley Crue and Poison and all those 80s hair bands, this is like a decade prior precursor ahead of its time. Uh, um, you know, musically, there's obviously a lot of country influence in the song. Um, oh, yeah. I also put Leonard Skinnerd. Yeah, they're, like kind of their more like simple man kind of stuff. Yeah, it it it, it falls sort of into that you know the Skinnerd simple man kind of category, but also there's um just in terms of like the the lyricism and the and the vibe of it, you know there's elements of like you know Willie Nelson and and Johnny Cash just in this the you know the the heartbreak and despair and the lyrics, um it, it and and it it really has that that mixture of. Uh, country lyricism and really a country melody, um, which you don't really get in the 80s hairband power ballads. So it's essentially a country song with the instrumentation of an 80s rock ballad done by a 70s Irish hard rock band, which is a <laughs> weird combination. Um, I've had a number of people in Nashville uh, tell me that they think this song would be really great if a country artist covered it and that it would be a potential um, country hit. I think that the chorus is not uh, poppy enough to be a, a hit in the modern country market, but I think that um, prior to the early 90s, this could have been a country hit if covered by the right artist. Uh, and I think my general thoughts on it, the lyrics are very strong, the melody is very strong, and it's a very unique song in the catalog, but because of its... Um, uniqueness it's a little bit less um melodically pleasing than other lizzie ballads but the emotion of the lyricism is very strong on this piece and so i, I still love it a lot i just i want like um 
I just want the hooks to be like bigger and more melodic and they're still excellent. But like I'm wanting that, you know, that Bon Jovi chorus and what I'm getting is a, is a good country chorus, but it's just, it's different than what I typically want with this instrumentation, but it's still an excellent song. Hey Greg, I've got really good news for you in terms of just like Thin Lizzy writing a country song that's better than this one. Did you know that on the previous album they had a song called Cowboy Song? Oh, no way. What? No, yeah. Oh, that's sweet. I should go listen to that. Yeah. That's awesome. So most of these I songs. I knew that. Most of the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. You're the expert on this, Victor. Uh, so most of these songs, I have some sarcastic note about such and such did it better, uh, where I note some version that came out at least six years later than this. This is the only one where I'm like, no, but Thin Lizzy did this one better previously. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. I I think you're right, Greg. I think a country variation on this would be also very good. Perhaps I would like it a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that weird uh, comment because it is very unique what it's offering like instrumentation wise for the era with that kind of melody, that kind of lyric. Like it does stand out very much as a very unique song. Uh, now, Chris, you ranked this really high. You gave this eight points out of a possible ten. So this has to be a little bit of a shocker to be this low on the ranking. Uh, not much of a shocker, but, um, you know... None I, of our I bullshit had, surprises uh, Chris anymore. The, I had it third from the top. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, the emotion of it appeals to me, and I, I, I really... Um, Love the, how you guys have talked about the country element. I mean, from the first time I heard it back in the 80s, uh, it, it, it instantly registered to me that, like like you were saying, that if Garth Brooks did a cover of this, that it would have been a hit. And I always kind of wanted that to happen because that would have meant that the Phil Line out of state and Phil Amino would have gotten a, a boatload of cash, which... I hope they did for the boys are back in downtown placement, the toys uh, movie franchise. But, um, you know, this would have been another one. And, uh, you know, I, I totally agree that um, had a country artist back during that time period uh, latched onto this and released it. Um, I think it would have been one of those kind of songs that, you know, people would have been unfamiliar with it, so they would have thought it was an original song by that artist. And, you know, I it's good to hear that like people actually in that industry in Nashville have that same um, opinion. So, uh, so, yeah, it's cool to hear you bring that up before I was going to bring it up. And, uh, and then we're on the same page there. And uh, I will also agree that stained is awful uh, uh, how, how, how this aaron lewis guy ever ascended beyond the level of mcdonald's fry cook is a complete mystery to me <laughs> then again then again as long as we're we're kind of on the country topic we have we live in a world where the likes of blake shelton and luke bryan are mega stars None of these guys, from my standpoint, possess any level of charisma. There's nothing about them that sets them apart from any regular schlub walking down the street. I just don't get it. So I'm, a, I'm with you guys on that take as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, we've sort of discussed this on many an episode, but there is, I think, post the grunge revolution – in a lot of ways, this desire of, you know, rock stars need to be normal people and just like everyone else, you know, the desire of them wearing street clothes. And I think that uh, a lot, like part of the appeal of a rock star is that you want them to be different. You don't want them to be your average. So you want, you want to be able to connect with them in some way, but you want them to be unique and interesting because otherwise, what's the point? And I feel like that applies with, you know, a variety of the arts. You know, Edgar Allan Poe is an interesting author, not because he's a standard normal guy. It's because he was like this weird, debauched, gothic, you know, crazy fuck who was drunk all the time. Like, that's what makes these people interesting. You don't want them to be just average and normal because you get kind of bland art. And uh, with Thin Lizzy, 
You know, these were a dynamic group of guys. Phil Lynott, one of the most original artists in hard rock. Uh, Brian Robertson, just a, a crazy motherfucker. You know, um, Scott Gorham, just the epitome of cool and swagger. And then Brian Downey, just a really, like, fascinating cat behind the drum kit. And so I, I think there is something lacking with uh, rock stars having the mystique and cool uh, and, you know, it's harder in the internet age when you're trying to communicate with your fan base and you, you want to come off as, like, someone they can relate to. But you, you, I think there's there's a balance, and I think the balance has been tipped too far on the scales of just, like, yeah, check me out in my flip-flops on stage. Like, no, fuck you. Where's something cool if you're going to be on stage? So it turns out that perhaps a big part of why Blake Shelton works is that he's entirely a manufactured thing. Dude doesn't even co-write his own songs. He appears on Garth Brooks and Gwen Stefani singles, doesn't write his own music. So, yeah, it's easy to take a generic-looking dude who can passably play uh, an acoustic guitar and passably sing and put somebody else's words and music in front of him and a competent backing band and make that a successful thing. Who's that other guy you mentioned? Uh, Luke Bryan. Oh, yeah, Luke Bryan. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, I get, you know, it, I get not having any talent and being a manufacturer <laughs> artist. I also, Brian also I appears also to not co-write his own songs. Like, not even co having a, but I also get having a ton of charisma and like personal magnetism. And I mean, not, have you been on farmers uh, com lately? <laughs> and, and and having that element and becoming a megastar. But if you lack both, like these guys do, how does it happen? I just don't <laughs> get it. So he's got anyway, all his let's teeth. get off of this. I, I, it's 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 starting to uh, raise my blood pressure. And at my age, that's not a good thing. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know, Chris Chris is drinking over there. He he he's, he gets to be a sad drunk. And so we don't want to be talking about, you know, these sad country songs and have him get, get even more drunk out of his upsetness over the state of the music industry. <laughs> so, yeah, let's move on to the, the next song on the list. So this is my favorite uh, ballad on the album. Uh, and I think this is much stronger than the, the other ballads, in my opinion. Um, so next up on the list, we have Old Flame. This one is a more traditional Thin Lizzy ballad in terms of the, the melody arrangement and composition. And so maybe that's part of the reason why I like it more is that it's like, yeah, this feels more like Lizzy. This is my comfort food. But um, like lyrically, uh, it's a it's a really, you know, strong song that resonates with me hard because I feel like anyone who has been in a relationship where they where they, there was a lot of potential for the future and then things didn't work out. You will always have like a part of your soul that pines for that past lover. And uh, even though like you can recognize how they might have been like unhealthy for you and like you recognize in the long run it's good you're not with them. There is still always going to be that small spark within your spirit because, you know, if you're someone who has given your heart to another person, like I don't think, you know, love can really die in that way. And so this song really captures that emotion so well. And, um, you know, once again, the great ebb and flow of Lizzie albums where there's the sensitivity and the vulnerability, but also the swagger. This is, you know, Phil really letting that vulnerability out on record in a very catchy, well-written song that, that in, in many ways raises the overall uh, quality of the album for him because it does fit in so well with many other Lizzie ballads and uh, makes me appreciate this album even more when there's a song this great on it. So uh, I love Old Flame. I think it's great, and I think it is crucial in the part of the album where it is and that it really uh, builds the appreciation of the record even more. Uh, Steve, why am I full of shit? Uh, well, a couple points. Uh, first of all, your wife's not going to listen to this episode, right? Right, but uh, look, I'm ha I'm happily look, I'm happily married, and I don't have any desire to get with you past lovers. But I think you that is to be pining for them. No, I'm not. <laughs> look, I think that I think that there is there is a part of of truth where just like you reflect on what your life could have been. You're happy with the state of your current being, but you, I mean, you do still care about those people from your past in some small way. Secondly, uh, that which slumbers may eternal lie, and given strange eons, even love may die. Yes, go on. 
<laughs> I, I understood that reference. <laughs> Thanks, Captain. Uh, no, I mean, I just like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, this song was okay. It was decently written. Well, you don't have exes. That's why you don't get it. <laughs> You're like, I've dated one person and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, anyway, uh, this, uh, this song was, it was fine. It was decently melodic, but if I were to do a, uh, punchy EP version of this album, this would probably be the cutoff that doesn't make it. And cowboy line would be just above the cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe depending on time constraints. If they're like, no, eh, you need to drop another one. Be like, okay, we can drop, we can drop borderline too. Well, Chris, you it's have a heart, so I you like this. Yes, I have some worldly experience that Steve <laughs> clearly lacks. But, uh, <laughs> Takes a long drag from his cigarette. <laughs> you know, it, it, again, I, I, I uh, am not drunk, but I'm reacting as if I am because Greg's analysis of it was 100% accurate and equal to mine which should be frightening to both of us. But, um, <laughs> Anytime you and I agree, that's just a bad sign for the universe. I like that you it call is, his analysis equal right after calling it great. You're like, Greg's analysis was great. Mine is equally great and identical, in fact, so it doesn't need to be restated. <laughs> <laughs> did I say it was great? I just, I guess you, it's great. You didn't, but you implied spot it. Spot on. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 bouncier than sweet marie a little more up tempo uh, it's kind of got that sort of whimsical feel to it and um and like greg said it's that demonstration of vulnerability that's like the opposite side of the coin from the immense um you know swagger and confidence and uh, cocksure attitude that these guys put out in a lot of their other material. So, uh, so yeah, I'm a fan of it. And Victor, you ranked this pretty high because it's a ballad. So <laughs> go on. Oh, me and my ballads. Um, I actually do like this song a lot. I think the only thing that kind of bugs me about it is um, I, I don't know if it's just like what I happen to be listening to it on or if it's something just, in the mix itself or if it was just a limitation of the time i i think the the riff kind of the main riff going on through the song is so good and cool but the way that it sort of um uh i think it lands it the i think it lands on the third beat of the measure where they all kind of like both guitars and the bass kind of hit a note together and it sounds super muddy most of the time I think towards the end, there's a few that sound really good, but there's it's just something in there that doesn't sound right to my ear. And I don't know if it's because they're making a weird complex chord with like multiple instruments and it just doesn't quite gel or if it's just mixing thing or if my ears suck ass. I don't know. But I I think other than that, this song is really fantastic and um it also has a very nice reactive uh, guitar solo that's reactive to what's going on rather than just a wah pedal. <laughs> <laughs> I actually will agree with you that I think of the uh, classic era Lizzie album, so with the classic lineup of uh, Gorham and Robertson, I think this is probably the muddiest out of all those albums where, you know, I think. Uh, all the other albums just have more clarity in the production. And there are certain tracks in this album. Uh, that I think the production is like noticeably clearer. So that that is something that I've noticed, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and that might be one of the reasons why maybe some of the material doesn't grab me as much as uh, some of the other albums. But uh, I I I I agree. The song is excellent. So you're correct, Victor. Thank you. I uh, mean, we're fourth from the bottom, and we're all just like, this song is great, except for Steve, because he's just like, oh, I haven't had a heartbreak. <laughs> yeah. <The> nerd. <laughs> you know it. Speaking of things that Steve is completely wrong about, next up on the list, we have Johnny the Fox meets Jimmy the Weed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? Oh, Yeah, I ranked this one at the bottom. Um, Mostly just because I really like story songs. At the bottom. Yep, the bottom. This is the absolute bottom for you yep because i like story songs and if you're gonna do like 
multiple songs telling the same story on a single album like tell a real story this one just doesn't go anywhere this song isn't catchy enough to justify how underdeveloped the storyline is also defeater did it better okay so um excuse me mr uh white mayonnaise from wisconsin who doesn't like any funk or r&b and soul music Mm -hmm. um for, for, for those of us who actually have a little bit of rhythm in our asses... Um, oh, are you really going to like be like, oh, this song is funkier than the rest? This song is barely funky, Greg. This, don't, uh, don't play the Steve doesn't have any funk in his soul card on this song I of will, all songs. I will play it on this song, sir. <laughs> and uh, look... It's very easy to play that card. It just comes up a lot of the show. You can play that card legitimately a lot of the time on me. This, yeah. This song but is about driving. This song. This song is about Phil Lynott driving to the hood because he's a black guy and won't get shot because if a white person goes to the hood, they'll get shot. I mean, with I get a, that that's what a, the song's about, but he didn't actually include any funk in the song. No, I think the song is. Very funky. I mean, that that drum line, that drum intro is just a classic funk, Parliament-esque intro. You would know if you listen to Parliament, which I know you don't. Um, so that's one thing. But this is, for me, this is prime Lizzie. Like, this is one of the, like, S-plus ranked songs where this is just in the stratosphere of blowing my mind. Um, in terms of the, you know, the concept of the story, it's a very loose half-concept album. But the idea that I've heard in uh, like interviews and discussions is that the idea that Johnny, um, the the protagonist of this album, dies in the first song on the album and then is reincarnated in different eras and different lifetimes and experiencing this you know spiritual journey of finding peace and you know becoming this fox spirit. And so this is one of his reincarnations in a different time, um, dealing with the shady character of Jimmy the Weed, you know, the shady, you know, drug deals and all that stuff. But it's just, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, solo on this track. Excellent riffing. Uh, it's, it's really, th- I think, maybe the best funky Thin Lizzy track. And just like, I think it's incredibly catchy, great hooks, just cool lyrics, swagger, uh, just like, this is awesome. And also, uh, shout out to my, my buddies uh, in the Gene Simmons band, uh, Phil Schaus and Jeremy Asbrock, because they were in a Thin Lizzy tribute band called Jimmy the Weed. And that's how I met those guys, that I saw a Thin Lizzy band, uh, cover band called Jimmy the Weed was playing a show. Went to the show. They were awesome. And then just walked back stage after the show and became friends with those guys. And, you know, Phil ended up appearing on the album. And so they picked a cool song to take their namesake from. This is awesome. You're full of shit. Fuck you. I love you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> this may be the funkiest uh, uh, Thin Lizzy song. It might not be the funkiest, but I'm saying this is the best funky Thin Lizzy song. Yeah, is my s- opinion. Still, this is, I don't know. Phil Collins probably played the drums on this one. Uh, actually, I don't think he did. He I, he did additional fills on Nobody Johnny, knows, I believe. Greg. Nobody knows what songs Phil Collins played on. It could yeah, very well have been this one. Could it's been, a mystery. Because he's got that invisible touch. Hey! Yeah. All right. Well, for for those of us that you have my, some funk in our in our souls, my um, favorite funk is the stuff that doesn't have any syncopation to it. Like lots of like straight ahead, like eighth note twin lead guitar kind of stuff. My favorite funk band is Arch Enemy. Uh, uh, sorry, my balls are shriveling up right now, Chris. Please, <laughs> please, please help us with this. <laughs> Oh, I, are your balls shriveling up because well, I like I like female musicians, Greg? No, because I think women can rock because, just as hard as men. No, because you're citing Arch Enemy as a funk band It's just hurting my soul on so many <laughs> levels where I need to drink. <laughs> I mean, we got whiskey in the jar. Oh, art! I could put it in a jar. I don't know. All right, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, it sounds like your balls are shriveling down to the size of Steve's at this point. <laughs> oh, given his, oh. given his take on this song, uh, look, this just one's my second from the top. If you want to like um, this song, that's fine. But you're like, I will fight on the like. How funky is this song? Some wah guitar doesn't a funk song make Greg? Otherwise, you wouldn't complain about Red Hot Chili Peppers so much. Th- there, are, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Chris jump in, but I have to refute that bullshit. This is very much a classic. <laughs> 
funk rhythm, and it's not like a generic funk rhythm. Like, this would fit in well on an Isaac Hayes record. Like, I actually listen to the genre, dude. Like, this this is potent stuff for the funk genre. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I'm actually going to side with Steve slightly on this point, and that, you know, um, and I'll equate it with the whole concept of the album is like the concept and funk in terms of relating to this song i just completely dismiss both just because it, it doesn't i don't know it's just it doesn't really it's not inherent in it to me i just take it as it is and um i mean the drumming is brilliant uh i would I would probably shed a tear if I found out it was actually Phil Collins. Phil Collins is a good drummer. You know, I'd like to believe that Brian Downey is the funkiest drummer ever to emerge from Ireland, and this would be his uh, his calling card on that. But I mean, all the drumming throughout is masterful. All the the fills, the snare work he does, leading into each uh, quote unquote chorus. I don't even know if there is a chorus in the song, but um, it's just incredible. Um, guitar playing is great. One of Brian Roberts Robertson's uh, best efforts. He is my all time favorite rock guitarist. So you know, I'm a fanboy for sure. Um, and also, and this was something I wanted to mention about boogie woogie dance but i guess i wasn't really expecting it to be at the bottom so i wasn't ready to <laughs> comment on it at that point but um it's got that dirty sort of decadent vibe to it and in in that way i kind of uh, equate it to a lot of the deep cuts from the early ZZ Top catalog, specifically uh, Precious and Grace, if you've ever heard that song. It's just got this dirty, uh, decadent vibe to it that I like. And um, uh, yeah, like I said, second from the top for me. Big fan of this one. Victor, you put it right in the middle. It's basically in the middle of the ranking. It's in the exact spot I put it in. Aha! <laughs> Congratulations. Um, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It's the one song I've ranked that's close to where it ended up. Um I I love the intro of this so much, but after that it kind of just becomes like he's just sort of talking and there's riffs happening, which I'm not <laughs> against. It's just like really weird, <laughs> especially in the context of the album being so otherwise like like pretty standard structure stuff for the most part and then to have this i do love it though because it's just so weird and i you know when i make albums i try and have weird shit happen in them <laughs> and this fills that quota i do like it a, i like it a lot um but i think the only part that really sticks with me is him going Johnny the Fox. <laughs> I mean, which is awesome. It, it's it's <laughs> awesome, but I know I think the entire atmosphere that this sets up, I think, is very cool. And I actually, I do like what this does for the narrative of the album. I only think I don't think that every song on this album actually fits into the narrative. Like, if you really fudge it. You can make a narrative out of this album, which we will do as a tradition for whenever we do a concept <laughs> album. <laughs> so we will do our, our figuring out the story based upon our ranking. But like, I don't, for for me, this is this is prime Lizzie. This is one of the standout cuts in the catalog. Period. Like, yeah, this is like this is S. This is S plus plus. Like this is this is a masterpiece. I love it. Uh, Really no complaints with this one whatsoever. I don't know. Prodigy did it better. <laughs> I was trying to look up drum tabs for it, and uh, I found a page that listed everybody that sampled it. And this was the uh, drum beat for Prodigy's Breathe. Funky. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to plow past that bullshit. And <laughs> Prodigy were good. Eh, they're fine. They're 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 fine. They're they're the kiss of dance music. When I think when I think of funky bands, I Get think of the prodigy. Track, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, are you drunk? 
so drunk right now. <laughs> drunk on power. Don't let Steve lure you down a prodigy path. <laughs> let's, uh, let's right the ship. I honestly do like the song Breathe. It's good. Breathe with me. All right, well, next up on the list, we have a song that was ranked very high by both Chris and Victor. So mm -hmm. so the two of you, uh, the two Skype guests, uh, unifying on this track, and then Steve and I ranked this towards the bottom. We've got Rocky next on the list. Whoa, Greg, towards the bottom. Now, I know what you're thinking. Greg, you love the Rocky movies, and Thin Lizzy wrote a song called Rocky. Therefore, you That's should exactly love this. What I, I mean, that does sound very on brand. I'm a little surprised it didn't turn out this way. <laughs> um, the song is not about Rocky Balboa, but instead about a rocker named Rocky, who is unfortunately a less interesting character than Rocky Balboa. <laughs> and melodically... Um, it is not as strong as some of the other pieces on the album. I do like that it's introducing another character to the story, but ultimately I don't think Rocky comes back into the story in any way. And so I'm disappointed that it's not about Rocky Balboa. I'm disappointed the character doesn't come back and I'm disappointed the melody isn't better, but it's still uh, great riffs, um, great gritty vocal delivery, phenomenal solo section, just really great. Uh, like the different sections of the solo are just excellent. Um, but I think this song sort of encompasses some of the problems I have with Johnny the Fox as a whole, in that I love Johnny the Fox, but I don't love it as a follow-up to Jailbreak, because I think what Lizzie really needed to do was to have like a couple really strong pop singles to keep the momentum from the boys are back in town and to really achieve that next level of success in the United States. And when you compare this to Jailbreak as an album, it's just, uh, you know, Angel from the Coast is, is a much stronger track, too. And, like, I want it to be, like, um, catchier and more poppy. And instead, they're going the route of being more rocking and aggressive and experimental. And I don't begrudge that, and I respect it. But I think it's not what I wanted from the follow-up to Jailbreak in terms of wanting to take the band to the next level. And because the song isn't as hooky... It's, um, I think its placement in the album hurts it a little bit for me, but I still think it's a strong song. I still like it quite a bit, uh, but it does give me, I do have some mixed feelings on it in terms of like its overall placement in the Thin Lizzy catalog, but like, it's still like an A. So like even a song that I have mixed feelings on in this catalog is still an A. It's just, it's not an S. And, uh, Steve, you just, it sucks. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Rocky. Um, so I realized as you were talking that, uh, my notes are dumb and I forgot what this song was about between listening to it today and writing and compiling my list. So I came up with the shtick of coming up with bands that did it better, uh, as I was getting towards the end of the list. And I looked back and was like, Rocky, oh yeah, that one was about boxing, right? Okay, Dropkick Murphys did it better. <laughs> uh, I found it kind of, uh, yeah, overall, I put it third from the bottom. It's kind of a forgettable song in that, like, it started playing, and I was like, I don't remember this song at all. Yeah, so, yeah. But uh, definitely, uh, definitely, you know, assuming Thin Lizzy can only write A, S, and S plus rank songs, I guess this is a solid low A. <laughs> that is an inaccurate way to categorize things, but whatever. <laughs> Look, I'm saying that's that's for me personally. This is my, you know, one of my top three favorite bands. So for me personally, there's nothing below an A on this album. It's just this is, you know, I'll give you A minus. Okay, you all right, then this one's a D. And that, like, I don't particularly <laughs> like it. I, if it was playing in the background, I wouldn't be like, what is this garbage? Turn it off. But I'd be like, oh, what's that song? Oh, okay, cool. I might even, like, Shazam it. And then promptly next time it came on, I'd be like, I feel like I've heard this song before. No, I wouldn't even do that. I'd be like, what's this song? And then Shazam it again. <laughs> but hey, it's good enough that you'd Shazam it. Maybe. Um, so Victor, this was your number two ranked song. I, I think um, this is one that I will agree is it's not super catchy. And I almost wish they were doing sort of, um, ah, I'm going to go here. Something that, um, REM does a lot in the first <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Only play two chords, not play drums. 
Uh, no, <laughs> mumble in their first couple of albums, not their twelfth album, um, <laughs> where they they'll do a verse and then a pre-chorus, and then instead of going to the chorus, they go back and do another verse and a pre-chorus. So then when you get to the chorus, you're like, oh god, yes. And I was kind of hoping that the song was going to do that, but it turns out that the chorus is just not that much of an evolution from the verse. <laughs> but then you get to that instrumental break and that fucking bow, that thing comes in and just like kicks you in the dick. And you're like, oh man, I love being kicked in the dick, apparently. <laughs> just, ah, uh, I. That riff is so goddamn good. I believe that's a that's a on Black Rose is what you're thinking about there, Victor. Oh, sorry. I, I understood that reference. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, yes, uh, Thin Lizzy, um, dicking around on a major scale. Uh, that's on all the albums, Steve. No, I was I was referencing the song S and M, Greg. Oh, Victor oh, likes right. being kicked in the dick. <laughs> that was that that was a good reference. It was a deep cut. That was uh, not. Man, that's my favorite Thin Lizzy album. I just wasn't on the ball with that. You weren't? Whoa. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I think that, um, I think you encompass uh, what you said there is the way I feel about a lot of these songs, is that a lot of the choruses feel like a great pre-chorus, and I want to get to that awesome chorus, and maybe that's what's lacking on the song for me. And I know that not every song needs to be a pop single. I get that. But... I think just, you know, where Thin Lizzy ended up in the overall rock pantheon, I just I really wanted that momentum to keep going. And I think it doesn't keep up with this track in particular from where they left off. But uh, Chris, this is your favorite track from the album. So obviously you love the song. Yeah, I have it number one mainly because it's the, my favorite guitar solo of all time. Um, just the... The composition, the build, the swagger of it, the whole thing is perfection. And, um, you know, I'm with Victor that when you combine that solo with that riff underneath it, it's just, uh, doesn't get much better than that for me. Um, but I agree with you, Greg, that this is probably the type of album that <clears throat> after Jailbreak, you know, they turn this into the record company and they're like, what is this? You know, I'm, I'm frankly surprised they released it um, without being kicked back to them and say, you know, where's the hit? Where's the next boys are back in town? I mean, I don't know what went into that decision making process, but um, I mean, you're totally right. They, uh, in a variety of ways, just completely short cir circuited their momentum from what is still a staple of classic rock radio so you know it's just one of those things that i don't know they just kind of did themselves in destiny wasn't on their side you know go down the list of things but there were several ways that they kind of short circuited themselves i mean the boys but, gotta um, leave town before they can come back <laughs> damn it steve <laughs> but no. yeah i mean i I don't know what to say other than that they just didn't uh, didn't follow up with uh, with another hit album and and that was it for them. And I and, you know I think it's um I think it's very unfortunate. I think you know if you uh, look at like Bad Reputation for example, I think Dancing in the Moonlight would have been a good follow up to Boys Are Back in Town because it is so catchy. Uh, you know, Black Rose has Waiting for an Alibi, which I think would have been a good follow up. And so it's just like it's so frustrating to know like you can you can sense like the closeness of it. And you know, thankfully they you know were able to, you know, Black Rose went to number 2 on the UK charts and they were able to build that overseas following. But it's just it's it's very like, you know, tragic as an American fan. We're like, "Oh, you guys were so close." And I understand, like, Phil being like, I'm sick, I wrote these songs in, like, a week, here you go. Oh, I didn't write a single, that's because I was sick and I had, like, a week to do it. <laughs> and so, it's, it's, it's a bummer in a lot of ways. But, you know, taking that aspect out of it and just looking for at the finished product, you know, it's still a great album, and I still love this album, and I love the song. Any other comments on Rocky before we move on? Other than 4 is the best one. Correct, yes. <laughs> One thing we can agree on this entire episode, Greg, Rocky Four, best Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, I would rank this song above Rocky Three. 
which has Eye of the Tiger in it and Mr. T and Hulk Hogan. I think. Yeah, you know, but like, Rocky Four has Eye of the Tiger in it too. So, but here's the thing about I'm gonna all right, real quick about Rocky Four. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's 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 not the best in terms of the meta narrative of the Rocky story, but as just a fun movie to watch, it's 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 a fun time. So in terms of like the meta narrative, yeah, it's probably like the least important part. But dude, it has like bros like hanging out on the beach, hugging each other. That's just our life, dude. I mean, Top Gun did it better. <laughs> but where do you think Top Gun got the idea? Uh, playing with the boys. Speaking of uh, other bands uh, doing it better in the future and taking uh, inspiration from th uh, things from the, from the late seventies, early eighties. Um, by the way, I disagree with that statement in regards to both Top Gun and this song. But next up on the list, I rank this number two on the album. But uh, it's in the number four in our rank, and we've got Massacre, and that's on the list. Uh, once again, prime Thin Lizzy. Like, this is Thin Lizzy doing what Thin Lizzy does at, like, maximum operating capacity. Um, the syncopation in the song is just insane. So excellent. Uh, Phil Linet is typically... Like, if I'm being completely honest, he's not the best bassist. He is okay. He is mainly a singer-songwriter who happens to play bass front in his band. Um, but his bass playing on this track is phenomenal. Great guitar playing, like Lizzie working as a unit. The drumming by Brian Downey is just... Uh, it's, it's, it's funky. It's metal. It's a little bit Celtic. It's all those things at once. And just something that is really... Like, only Lizzie could have done this. And like or blended, maybe Genesis. What? Brian Downey and or Phil Collins. Or and or Phil Collins. But like, I mean, look, he plays it live and I've seen, and I've, you know, I've watched the live videos and he, he nails uh, Phil Collins drum parts if this was what, if this was Phil Collins. So he nails it live <laughs> at least. Um, but this is the blending of those different influences of the, of the funk, of the Celtic thing and the hard rock thing all together creates this very unique sound that ended up influencing, you know, a whole bunch of other bands. Iron Maiden covered the song, and obviously this influenced, you know, the big four of thrash with this sound. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a phenomenal vocal performance, interesting lyrics, uh, and this is, for me, like, the epitome of the Thin Lizzy battle songs done right. Perhaps the best Thin Lizzy battle song. Just, like, everything about it is perfect. I, I, I have nothing to say bad about this song at all. Like, everything that happens in it is perfectly done. Like, yeah, this is perfection. Uh, who doesn't like perfection? So my snarky comment with this song as I was sending Greg my notes was, uh, well, this just sounds like Run to the Hills. Iron Maiden did it better. And then Greg was like, uh, yeah, I feel like I, I could see the point that Iron Maiden did this song better. And then pointed out to me that Iron Maiden had, in fact, covered it. And was like, well, boy, don't I look like an asshole. <laughs> Steve looking like an asshole for the first time on this show. It's true. Everybody should make a note of that. Uh, episode 110, I think is what I called this one. Uh, first time Steve looks like an asshole. Uh, I put this in the middle. I thought it was a, uh, it, it was um like as a proto version of that sound. You can definitely hear that influence, you know, echoing throughout rock music. I feel like. Other people refined that sound and made it work a little better, but you do have to respect Thin Lizzy for, you know, sort of pioneering it. I was trying to figure out, like, what he was going for with all of the vocal delay, if that was meant to make it sound like this is kind of like Cowboys in Space sort of thing, or what? Well, what I took it as is because if you listen to the lyrics, it's about like being like a snowy mountain. So it's like the echo of the mountains is how I took it, uh. which I think is very cool. And what I'll say is I think other bands, you know, there's a, there's a critique about hair metal bands is that they took the wrong lessons from Van Halen and uh, they lost the, uh, the, the rhythm and swagger and like became a little bit too robotic and lost the feel uh, and like the the swing that made Van Halen uh, distinct, and I think a lot of metal bands took these lessons from Lizzie, but they lost that swing, they lost that funk, and they became very robotic. And then that became the template for metal. But you know, surprise, the guy who likes Thin Lizzy a lot prefers what Thin Lizzy did than all the bands that Thin Lizzy were influenced that influenced by were influenced by Lizzie. Uh, I I like that it's it has a, it has more of a uh, unique identity. 
than a lot of those metal bands that came after them. And I really like that there's more soul and feel to the playing. So, um, yeah, absolute masterpiece. Um, Chris ranked it second from the bottom, but I know you don't think there's a bad song on this album. So why is it less good than the songs you ranked above it? Um, I don't know. It's just... Um... I don't, I don't think it's as strong as a uh, boogie woogie dance in terms of that style of uh, music, that kind of tribal drumming and uh, um, a little, little more of an aggressive song. I, I would put um, boogie woogie dance above it also because it's a little bit weirder. Um, also, I kind of also, um, and this is not, um, a negative necessarily but this is song is to me is kind of like the in, antithesis of cowboy song from the previous album you know when i hear lyrics like uh, 600 unknown heroes killed like sleeping buffalo you know i think of like the you know the cowboys and indians battling um you know in the late 1800s and so whereas cowboy song is a more whimsical wistful look at the wild west this is kind of delving into you know the the sort of darker side of it so um i just always thought that was kind of an interesting uh flip side of that uh one thing i will say that uh this contains one of my favorite uh types of phil vocalisms um are you guys familiar with the TV show Welcome Back Cotter at all. I've I've seen a couple episodes on reruns, but I honestly I haven't watched it since I was like maybe thirteen. Well, something he, he does occasionally on vocals, I, I'm sure obviously unintentionally, but it comes comes out organically is occasionally he'll lapse into a Vinnie Barbarino mode with his vocals. And this one contains probably my favorite example that the uh, the way he goes, uh, how could this happen here? You know, he, he like becomes this this New York uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, street urchin uh, talking just his vocal inflection on that. It just kind of kind of amuses me when he goes into that line. Um, but, um, no, it's good. It's just, I like all the other songs that are above it better on this album. I, I do like when Phil goes into that kind of, uh, vocal inflection. He does that on a bunch of songs throughout the catalog. Um, because I don't know Welcome Back Cotter as much, I just, uh, am sucked in by the emotional power of it. But I do, uh, I do like that you have that different perspective and can get a little bit of a chuckle from it. Um... Victor, what 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 are your thoughts on Massacre? Uh, this song in particular. This this one on massacres generally. I, no, not, no, just, <laughs> no, just on just on the song. I mean, massacres. I assume you're you're really into them. Pro, just, yeah. pro um, massacres. <laughs> so this is another one that's like this opening is so Metallica, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, except the main difference being like the notes that are being hit. Lars would mimic those exactly, whereas um, uh, Robert Downey Sr. is <laughs> just kind of is uh, <laughs> he's just playing a beat under it, and I think that works maybe better. It's not like like Metallica's arrangements are usually so theatrical, and this is more like this just kind of rocks. And then when it goes into that main riff, just ah, it's so fucking cool. Um, you guys were speculating on the reason for the um, uh, the delay effect on his vocal during the verses. Yes. As um, the expert, do you know? Yeah, it's because um, it fucking sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why. Uh, it it kind of reminds me, especially not necessarily what's actually happening, but like more in terms of the um it's i guess yeah it's sort of the stage setting of the lyrics and the delivery in the verses reminds me a lot of um uh, of u2 <laughs> like certainly 
probably before they got real big, but kind of in their earlier uh, post-punk days. Um, so I was very into that as well. And I love the drums in this song. Yep. So all around, I mean, this is um, a classic of the of the Lizzie live set, like a staple. Um, I'm surprised that it ended up ranking fourth, but uh, look, I'm not rigging the votes. Um, next up on the list is... Uh, the opening track on the album, one of my all-time favorite drum songs. We've got Johnny next on the list. The best of the two songs that start with the word Johnny in the title. <laughs> I mean, yes, I, I agree with that. Um, I like to say things that Greg agrees with, but they kind of make him mad. <laughs> because <they're laughs> uh, but yeah, this is... Also the second of three songs in a row that are tied. Yes, uh, they're they're tied, but with our tiebreaker rules, this is where this one ends up. Um, this this is a great opener to the album. When you have album openers, they don't typically need to be as catchy. Uh, but you can just if as long as it's energetic and rocks hard, it do, it doesn't. You don't need to open with the pop single. But this is such a great opener for. Uh, if if this was a full concept album, what a great opening in that it builds the character of Johnny and it's just one of the coolest opening lines for a song ever. And you, you know, do the and media res thing where it's right. like, what, how did he get to this how did position? He get to this? Yeah. But and then it, it turns out it doesn't matter. But it, it there's, there's, there's a, there's so much that happens within the song. You learn that Johnny, uh, you know, is desperate for drug money, robbed a store um, you know, gets gunned down by the cops. Uh, you learn that his sister is a nun, you know, the parents have sort of disowned him and, uh, you know, he dies with, you know, that, that necklace, uh, you know, with, with a, with a picture inside of his family removed and, uh, you know, becoming the Fox spirit at the end of the song. Like there's just all that within this song with some of the most kick-ass drum fills ever, a great riff and just like lyrics that just get stuck in your head. Like it's all it's all right to lose your heart, but never lose your head. Like that was like one of my you know quotes on Facebook where I would like about yourself. I'm like, oh, just this quote. Like it's just it's really really cool. And this is a masterpiece. Uh, for you know the flaws I have with the album following up Jailbreak, this is a great opening track to this album and is a worthy successor and worthy follow up to that album. And just yeah, this is so so good. One of my favorite Lizzie songs, uh, just all around excellent. Uh, I love this track. Steve, what were your thoughts on this one? Uh, I put this one towards the top as well. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I put this one third. Um, it's uh, I like the the palm muted riffing thing. Like, you know, I said that snarky thing about Arch Enemy earlier, but I feel like Arch Enemy has a lot of Thin Lizzy influence in their guitar work, and I love it. Uh, like. At their at their peak, Thin Lizzy sounds like proto Arch Enemy, and this is this song is a really good example of it. It's it is a great setup to a story that disappointingly never really comes to fruition. Uh, so it's the last Jedi of Thin Lizzy song, right? Exactly. I I I wish the the story had been more satisfying uh, than than what this this staged. Uh, this would be one of those things where, like, if you heard this on the radio and you, like, somebody was t telling you, like, yeah, this is the opening song from the new Thin Lizzy album, it's a rock opera, I would have been like, sweet, that sounds super awesome, and then been disappointed in the rest of the album. Uh, so, so Chris, you don't care about rock operas, uh, so this came in third from the bottom for you? Yeah, uh, again, I, I don't really, I just kind of tune out the whole, uh storyline that's uh supposed to be weaving through this whole thing and um and dog it, i mean it's okay yeah he's going ballistic <laughs> back there he's he's more on uh steve's side so it's like the narrative um, is the most important part <laughs> yeah exactly he's he's into that he he, he responds to that so uh anyway um <laughs> yeah yeah he's not feeling my take on this but um I mean, it's it's good. I just like I said, it's something had to be toward the bottom, and I just kind of prefer all the other songs that were above it, just because it's to me there's so much strong material on this album. So, uh, so yeah, it's not like I dislike it. It's just uh, 
has to be something ranking towards the bottom. That's why when people always freak out when uh, we get into the exercise of ranking Zeppelin albums and I tell them four and Houses of the Holy are in my bottom three, everybody blows a gasket over that. It's like, well, Isn't it's not Dire like Maker I don't on like four? those albums. Yeah, it's on Houses of the Holy. Uh, oh, it's so. on Houses of the Holy. So the best Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean... Uh, People freak out when I say that, and I'm like, oh, it's not like I don't like them. It's just something has to rank at the bottom or toward the bottom when we're having these discussions. And for me, uh, yeah, Johnny's in the bottom three here. Yeah, I think just for me, just the, the character of Johnny and just like this sort of like unredeemed, like urban, like anti hero who through the course of the album can be like redeemed through like weird afterlife spiritual experiences is just, it's really fascinating on a lot of levels for me, but like just as an opener, just it's, it's, it builds that sense of atmosphere. I love the guitars at the beginning that kind of sound like sirens. Like it's, it's, it is so menacing and cool. Um, Victor, you are normally uh, notoriously lyric death. Did you notice the lyrics to this one? <laughs> I noticed the part where they said, oh, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Came up a few times. Um, and I kind of recall him robbing a place. But other than that, not really. <laughs> that It was interesting to hear you guys talk about there being sort of a meta narrative here. And then that meta narrative ends up being like some combination of Cloud Atlas and Enter the Void. Wow, deep cut. <laughs> um, so that that would have been cool. I'd love to hear that album too. Um, this song, I think, is like the chorus is great, the drums are great, but the solos on this song they're like very impressive, but they don't really stick with me. Like his guitar sound is really cool, but the solo itself doesn't feel that interesting, other than being. Uh, pretty technical uh but i don't have a ton more about this song what kind of impression did this give you so you'd only really heard jailbreak and boys are back in town and then later you discovered you remembered bad reputation but like what did this make you feel like the kind of album you were getting into what kind of like first impression did this set for you because this is kind of this is your first lizzie album yeah um it did set like he kind of does this storytelling thing that reminds me a little bit of like I haven't listened to a lot of Bruce Springsteen. It reminds me a little bit of that. It reminds me a little bit of, um, you know, like to bring up U2 again, not just because the Irish thing, but like they both do a little bit of storytelling a lot of times. So those two things kind of stuck out. But then there's like these guys can fucking rip. So that was cool. And I was very excited. And then when like the one two punch of this and Rocky, I think, set me up for an album that ended up being very different. Um, but I. I hearing this song, I was very uh, pleased with what I was about to get into. It wasn't like when you listen to one for all where you're like, Oh no, mm. <laughs> it was not like that at all. <laughs> well, Hey, we're at the, the number two song in the ranking. So next up on the list, we've got fool's gold. -na 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 -na. Uh, so happy All right, I forgot I got the top three exactly right. Yeah, you did. Uh, so happy St. Th Patrick's Day because there's nothing more Irish than Phil Lynott talking about the potato famine at the start of a song. <laughs> <laughs> it's aggressively Irish. It's, it is so Irish. And then the next track was uh, Johnny the Fox meets Jimmy the Weeble. But guys, I'm black too. <laughs> just Indeed. to make sure uh, but yeah that is so he's just dealing potatoes in the bad part of Dublin <laughs> uh, yeah uh, Fool's Gold it's almost like um, if you had a computer algorithm write a Thin Lizzy song this is what <laughs> it would come up with we're just like we're gonna have some ringing out power chords we're gonna have some guitar harmonies we're gonna have some lyrics vaguely about the uh, american west but also we need to make it super irish i just just sub sub something irish at the beginning of the song um and then we're gonna rip off a pat benatar riff uh, yeah wow 
<laughs> uh, what Pat Benatar song are you, are you saying and tripping off? Hit me with your best shot. Uh, your best shot. Isn't that after this? Yes, Greg, that's the joke. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do have like meaningful insight on the song and that like, so Phil wrote most of this album in a hospital bed after his uh, first North American tour got, you know, cut short by him contracting hepatitis. Right. And so he writes this song, which is all about people going to America to seek their fortunes and how, you know, may or may not always work out for them while he's back in, you know, Presumably, um, Ireland. I'm not exactly sure where. Maybe the UK, I believe. Back at back at you know somewhere in the UK, recovering the from his uh, failed attempt <laughs> to go to America to pursue his fortune. I think there's a probably there's probably one of the deepest songs on the album for that. Yeah, it's it's sort of weird. Where in some ways it feels like it's it's very sincere, but in other ways it feels almost like almost a little bit like autopilot in the writing of like the, the chord structure where it's just, it's been done on so many other Lizzie songs. I think ultimately better on a lot of the other Lizzie songs that follow the same sort of structure, but you know, great lyrics, uh, great leads. And even if it is like, you know, prototypical Lizzie, it is prototypical Lizzie in their prime. And even if it's like kind of tired, thin Lizzie in their prime, it's still Thin Lizzy in their prime doing all the Lizzyisms that you love. Um, this might be my favorite solo on the record. I believe this is a, a Scott Gorham solo because it seems to be more melodically structured and less about wagging your dick around, which uh, there, there's room for both. But uh, I tend to prefer um, the more melodic solos and that you really get that from this track. Um, but yeah, it's uh, really cool lyrics. And, uh, you know, may maybe Johnny was, um, you know, going to America after the potato famine in one of his many lives. So, <laughs> I know, mean, there's like three of them listed in the song. Maybe maybe what this is, it's like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, where Jojo isn't one character, but an entire line of characters named Jojo. So maybe there's Johnny, his son, Johnny the second, Johnny the third. So maybe this is Johnny's Bizarre Adventure. I think half of the Jojos are named Johnny, aren't they? Yes, so maybe this is just JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So this album. is just a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fanfic. Right. JoJo did it better. It's fair. <laughs> uh, Victor, what did you think of Fool's Gold? I really love the chorus of this and can kind of take or leave the rest of it. Um, but I love kind of the uneven harmonies and uh, the riff during the chorus, but I don't really remember anything else that happens in the song mm. aside from the opening voiceover done by a pirate character. <laughs> Yar! How, how, how did you feel the first time you heard that? Were you expecting something that Irish? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it left that much of an impression on me other than being like, oh, here we go with a voiceover and he has an accent. I forgot. <laughs> I yeah I I don't know this song didn't leave that much of an impression on me and yet it's Even, number two in the ranking so classic I know. classic Victor <laughs> well get get ready for number one <laughs> <laughs> yeah buddy so uh so Chris uh, you ranked this pretty high on your list fool's gold uh, thin Lizzy classic oh yeah uh, I had it fourth on the list and um, first of all. Um, I'm surprised I'm going to be the first one mentioning this, but the intro is just absolutely uh, Stonehenge by Spinal Tap. I mean, it's <laughs> Thin Lizzy's version of that. I mean, the first time we heard it. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure I heard this album for the first time after seeing Spinal Tap, and, and me and my roommate Gary uh, listened to this album for the first time, and when this came on, we were just howling in laughter at and the, oh how the, the, the potato the, farmed for yeah, fear you know, that the, dawn the, may come too soon yeah and, and the connection to stonehenge at the time and we just couldn't stop laughing at it to the point where you know it's been 30 plus years since i've been in college to this day me and gary will 
text each other back and forth in the year of the fan. <laughs> and then he'll, he'll text me back the next line and we'll go back and forth until the whole thing is over with. And this happens probably three times a year. You know, <laughs> three times a year for the past 30 years. So so this out this song has some sentimental value but for me. But but then when when that's all over and it kicks in with like Steve mentioned the hit me with your best shot chord progression. It's which, a good to be riff. honest with you. I, I even if you've I always it knew times. it was lingering out there in some other song, but I never knew what it was, and that that's the one. It's a great progression. The lyrics are great. They're I, I, they take that excerpt from it. It's on the inner sleeve to kind of reinforce the concept of the album i mean again that, that whole concept is lost on me so i just tune it out but um um and then you know most guitar nerds would rank this as uh, scott gorham's finest solo in the entire catalog so uh so yeah it's good stuff all the way around yeah uh two things i will say as far as the uh Spinal Tap moments in the Lizzie catalog. I think it's really hard to top the Spinal Tap isms in, uh, I believe it's Angel of Death, where uh, Phil starts to monologue about Nostradamus and his predictions. Uh, <laughs> while there's like those Spinal Tapish keyboards by Darren Warden going on in the background, uh, this is very Spinal Tapish. But those keyboards and talking about Nostradamus take it to another Spinal Tap level, and. Um, my personal favorite Gorham solo in the Lizzie catalog is the one on Dedication. Uh, I think that's just the most well-composed solo he's done, but also it has a lot of aggression. It's more aggressive than he typically plays, and I think uh, the emotion of the piece really shines through on it. But Fool's Gold is absolutely uh, towards the top of the heat of Scott Gorham solo, so I definitely agree with that statement. But yeah, any other comments on Fool's Gold before we move on? Nope. All right, so before we get to the number one song in the ranking, we have to figure out the narrative of this story in order of our ranking. So, uh, Vic, are you ready to do this? Yeah, I, I, there was a, I was thinking about this throughout, and there's a couple that I, I think I, I, that I can help with, but I'm excited to do it all together. Chris, I know you're not much of a concept album guy, but do you think you can do you think you can contribute to this this story that we're making? Uh, my initial thought is no. Uh, I don't uh, like I said. I've never even um, considered the alleged concept of this, but I mean, that's okay because we're be reconsidering the alleged concept because your... we're doing it in the wrong order. Yeah. So. Uh, be semi interested in what you guys have to say here. <laughs> semi interested. If we can keep even our own panelists semi interested, we've got a good show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So boogie woogie dance. So the story obviously starts in France. Where I they think, have a dance. <laughs> I think it starts, in fact, not in France. I think it starts with Johnny in a small town, Dublin, looking at all these interesting places in the world that he's never been and saying. I hear that there's a lot of cool stuff going on in France and Spain and Brazil, and I dream of going there one day and doing some effing dances. He and, dreams of leaving his small town. And uh, leaving behind his sweet Marie? Exactly. Or so, going to France and meeting Marie Antoinette. Ooh. Ooh, okay. So this is... All right, so this is uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Uh, so, so JoJo... <laughs> you know, it, can I can I interject here? I actually have something. I yes, didn't please. think I would, but think of this connection, guys. French fries, potato famine. Oh, oh shit. Be some, there's gotta be something there. It literally just occurred to it me. It does. Um, Is Dublin so on the coast? Maybe, maybe it's because we just discussed, discussed fool's gold, but I'm making that connection here. Is Dublin on the coast? Uh, I don't believe it is, but I'm not certain. I thought it was m more main inland, but I don't know. Maybe he's maybe he's somewhere in rural Ireland, like along the coast, where he can leave Sweet Marie with the seashells, staring plaintively into the sea as he sails away to seek his fortune, where there are maybe more potatoes. All right, so I th I, th I think I I think I got it. So he's um. 
seeking to go to the to to France to learn how to cook some French fries, unaware that the potato famine is coming later on. Ooh. So it's, oh. like, it's very 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 bittersweet. But let's let we'll, we'll get we'll get to that later. So he goes to to France, meets Sweet Marie. Uh, but then decides he wants to, he goes, uh, it doesn't work out with Sweet Marie, so he goes to America and just drinks alone because he's sad. Yeah, everything's falling apart. He, he, okay, so he left Sweet Marie on the coast of France to try his fortune again in America. And he's just, and, uh, he's re, he's reflecting on his old flame, Sweet right? Marie. Sweet and Marie. that's when he falls in with <laughs> Jimmy now, the Weed. Let me interject again something, something that's occurring to me. Mm-hmm. Remember when I made the analogy between Aaron Lewis and the fry cook? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, so he's in America, meets Jimmy the Weed, trying to get some of those sweet, sweet potatoes because he misses them so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> trying to buy potatoes in the bad part of town. Right, trying to buy potatoes in the bad part of town. And speaking of people he meets in the bad part of town, he goes to a show uh, that Rocky puts on. Cocky Rocky, the rock and roll star. And um, then... Oh, God. Uh, well, then things go a little <laughs> oh, bit Jesus. awry. I mean, they've already gone pretty awry in that he misses his, you know, he misses his true love in France and there are no potatoes and he's broken drunk. Yeah, so in the middle of the rock show, they get invaded and uh, attacked. Um, oh, 600 people are killed like sleeping buffalo at a show. It's uh, <laughs> it's, it's very tragic. Uh, this got real dark. Got real dark. And then um, then Johnny, uh, desperate to get those potatoes, um, goes, robs, robs a store, gets shot and killed. Uh, and as, as he dies... Um, Dying in the gutter, along with several other people who came to America and chased dreams that went poorly. Uh, he reflects on um, the the potato famine and how he went to America in search of fool's gold. Some other people he met on his journey, the old prospector. Yeah, he reflects and, upon uh, that. Broken Joe and uh, Rocky and Rocky and yeah, the yeah. vulture dude. All yeah, of he reflects whom also upon that one time he like rescued a girl from a circus. <laughs> <laughs> he rescued her and she was also performing at the show with Rocky she was like one of those burlesque dancers that are at the cock rock shows and uh, <laughs> during the massacre he saved her from the from the villainous vultures that were committing the massacre exactly and um, but the, you know and uh, he then as he as in his last moments of life he reflects upon the words he has said to the different women in his life. Well, hold on. As he reflects in his last moments of life on what happened with this entire story, he says, "Don't believe a word." Fucking unreliable narrators. Ah, such bullshit. <laughs> Johnny was a liar the whole time. Johnny just made this all up to impress some girl in France. <laughs> And that's how I'm reincarnated. Have sex with my fox penis. <laughs> I'm a furry. Let's go see Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh, <laughs> this good song. Don't though. believe a yiff. <laughs> the, uh... You know, I gotta say, that's a pretty brilliant analysis of I've... that whole thing. I it makes like sense. We ended up with a better, more concise plot than the actual album had. I think that's happened almost every time we've done this on this show, It's Steve. true. It's almost <laughs> as if every album that we do an episode on that is quote-unquote a rock opera was kind of incoherent and thrown together in a way that did not reinforce the narrative. We need to do your favorite album, The Wall. The Wall episode so is going to be very miss. long. Just so we can be wrong for once. Yeah. <laughs> I was an asshole for the first time today, and then later on we can be wrong. Right. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> don't believe a word, um, you know – Standout cut from the album, standout cut in the catalog. Um, I would say this is Brian Robertson's single greatest contribution to the band is this song, in that the original that Phil wrote was like an acoustic 12 bar blues song. And lyrically, it was an excellent, excellent piece. But what makes this song shine is that the balance of the brilliant poetic lyricism and the vulnerability of the of the lyric with just the the bitchin hard rock menacing guitars and those two like playing against each other is something unique that you didn't really see in rock music in the 70s made it very unique and it was sort of encompassing everything that is great about Lizzie in one song 
And this is the kind of song where I could play it for my millennial friends when I was in high school and they would be really impressed by it. And they're like, whoa, classic rock bands have lyrics like this? I'm like, yeah, Thin Lizzy does. Classic rock bands write songs that are shorter than 15 minutes? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it was not strong enough in terms of like, um, like vocal hooks to be a follow-up single to Boys Are Back in Town. But it is such a cool song to appreciate like as a music fan, as a lover of music, and someone who really enjoys like diving into an album. Like I do think this is the strongest song on the album. I do think this is one of the strongest songs in the Lizzie catalog. And if you actually are actively listening to it, it's an amazing, you know, perfect song. But I can see why it's not the earworm like radio single. But it's just, it's so good on every level. The lyrics, like, every line is perfection. Um, phenomenal guitar solo. Uh, it's short. It's concise. It's punchy. And just, you know, once again, like, Brian Robertson telling Phil, your arrangement is shite. Uh, let's rock it up. Is, I think, the single best thing he brought to the band. Uh, because it just makes the song so much better. Makes the song an absolute masterpiece. Uh, and so I just, I love this piece and I love everything about it. I think it's a, it, it is a tight, punchy song. It does clock in it under two and a half minutes, but I think that works for it. That's all this song needs to be. They didn't need to drag it out. And, uh, I, I love the meta, meta commentary on just the nature of songwriting where this song is all about how everything he says, especially if he's talking about a girl and, you know, saying sweet nothings to her is just you know a load of bullshit that he's making because he's a songwriter yeah it's 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 so good it is so good victor why are you so wrong about this uh, you don't want to hear what i have to say oh but we do, <laughs> we do. <laughs> it's so short that by the time my brain has begun actively listening it's already over <laughs> <laughs> i don't fair. say this often I would actually like for this song to be longer. <laughs> you wanted um, the song to be done by Jim Steinman. I did. That's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> um, I, I do like the meta element. Um, but again, I, I'm so lyrics deaf. I pretty much get the chorus, like, or the, the name of the song and like an occasional gerund here or there. <laughs> and I like so I don't really know the words that well. And I believe you that it's about that, and that's a very cool thing to write a song about, especially <laughs> in '76. But... I mean, you probably shouldn't believe us when we tell you the words to oh. this song aren't true. Oh shit! Oh, there's a God. lot of layers here. Uh, but, but I think you're bringing up a great point. Or should you not believe me when I tell you not to believe me? <sighs> the, Sorry, the, Greg. Go ahead. No, the great point that Victor is bringing up is that if you're someone who really pays attention to lyrics this is a phenomenal song but if you are lyrics death this song is just kind of like an you know middle of the road song on the album or or low mids in victor's case and i think that's why it didn't succeed as a single because the general music populace no offense victor is is stupid and doesn't pay attention to lyrics you're <laughs> no, not totally you're not, i don't think you're <laughs> stupid because you know it's a lot of you're you're a musician you know a lot of the intricacies of the chord changes and structure, and you pay attention to things. But I think this is the example of like why it didn't work as a mainstream pop single. You know, around the same time of like you know songs like Precious and Few and stuff like that. You know, it's not those big, uh, it's not those big Barry Manilow hooks. But sure. it, it, but but if you're a lyrics, if you're if you're listening to the lyrics, like this is poetry. Def Leppard covered this song in 2006. Yeah, they did, and it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the cover of the album that they did it for looks like a like a School of Rock, Disney's high school musical. Yeah, that <laughs> album was remarkably fine. Uh, I mean, imagine a Def Leppard album in 2006 being underwhelming. What? <laughs> I mean, it was... How could that uh, happen? It was good. It just... I, I don't, it, look, you'd think covering th Thin Lizzy and T-Rex on the same app would make me more excited, but... Eh. you think it would, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Chris, are, are you surprised at all that this was what won the ranking? No, because, I mean, it's the 
it's the you know cornerstone song on the album um i had a fourth um mainly because uh it's one of those where i prefer the live version and if you thought the studio version was short the live version is clocks in and i think like two minutes and 10 seconds something like that <laughs> and it's even better that way and the 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 solo is even more incendiary on the live version um so that's the main reason why i had it bumped down a little bit but i mean i agree that it's uh lyrically probably at or near the top of uh phil's list of of uh lyrical achievement and um and yeah the, the Def Leppard version I I, li- I have that album I like it I have the same reaction to it as Greg but uh it just doesn't have anywhere near the fire of even the studio version much less the live version um I would say the Blondie cover is the best tune on that Def Leppard album but uh <laughs> but I digress um <laughs> Yeah, it's an all-covers album, song. isn't it? Yeah, it's their spaghetti incident, basically. Um, but um, that's so. This is a great song. Uh, 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 it's a Mott the uh, Hoople song too, Greg. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware yeah. of what. Look, I'm I'm a and glam the Bowie fan. song. I am very familiar with what's on that album, Steve. <laughs> There's even a Jeff Lynn song. Well, we won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but, uh, you know, this is obviously one of their signature songs and, uh, it's a great one. I just, uh, uh docked it a couple notches mainly because I, I just love the, the live and dangerous version so much more. Yeah. And, uh, just on the subject of, um, hair metal bands releasing covers, albums and covering Thin Lizzy songs, uh, to me, I think the best Thin Lizzy cover is still the Warrant cover of Hollywood down on your luck. Um, I think it is actually better than the Lizzie original. And that, you know, album is what, uh, that, you know, song and that album is what inspired me to hire Billy Morris to play guitar for lipstick. Uh, just, um, a really phenomenal potent cover of a great Lizzie song. Uh, but you know, don't believe a word back to this album. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite Lizzie songs. It's just, it's everything I love about the band you know, in under three minutes. Uh, and it's, and it's one of those songs that will impress, you know, the, the sensitive millennial types, but th- this was one of the songs that like every time I played it for a friend and we were actively listening, they were impressed. It, this was one of the Lizzie songs that worked pretty much every time for, for the, the lyric minded millennials. But yeah, so that is our ranking of John and the Fox. Uh, general thoughts on the ranking, uh, were you guys happy with it, surprised by it, and I also want to get, uh, Victor's takeaway of Thin Lizzy as a band, and, um, you know, him, he knows my taste pretty well, and so he's like, alright, this is a very much a Greg kind of band, so I want to get Victor's thoughts and all that, but also general thoughts on the ranking, um, Chris, let's start with you, what were your thoughts on this, the ranking of this album, and, like, the general feedback on it? Um, you know, like I said, uh, all the songs are strong in my opinion. They could pretty much go in any order. Um, I didn't really disagree with anybody's take today. Um, you know, I think, um, it, it kind of, uh, ended up how I would have expected it. Um, you know, and I expected don't believe a word to be toward the top and, uh, or at the top because it's clearly was the, the cornerstone song in this album. Um, so, uh, no, pretty much went, um, as I expected. So, um, no surprises here. Thanks for including me on this. Like I said, it's favorite, um, thin Lizzie album of all time. Uh, greatest guitar solo of all time is on it. So I was happy to get the invitation and I enjoyed, uh, Victor's takes on most of the stuff. So it was a, a refreshing bonus for me. All right. So Victor, your general takeaway from this, uh, this, uh, this whole experience. Well, as usual, I listened to the album four or five, six times and, uh, put together a very delicately balanced kind of perfect version of the order that the song should go in. 
in terms of their quality and then you animals <laughs> get your fucking mitts on it and rip it to shreds <laughs> <laughs> But I, this is a band that has like this kind of potent substance. There is something about being a band from Ireland that I don't know. Maybe it's it's just a country of poets and like people with a, a lot to say. And I was very interested to hear a lot of the takes on what the songs are about and the way they go about them. And then the fact that they could play some sick riffs and shred over it didn't hurt either um this is certainly a band i'm willing to go through the catalog on because uh even though i don't think i fully love this album i could see myself finding a lizzie album that's for me and part of that i think greg we were talking earlier some of it might be rushed production stuff and i could see a thin lizzie that has uh more time to get their shit together could really blow me away. Yeah, because I mean, this, in my opinion, you know, we talked about earlier, this is, you know, fourth from the bottom in the overall catalog. And so if I'm saying this is like the bottom, like I would say, imagine what the rest is in comparison. We're like, yeah, this is the one where like they were rushed and didn't have the time to refine it. And if it's this impressive when they're like rushed and just shoving it out, I think that speaks to like, the kind of stuff uh, you could uh, get into. And so I think that's the, the highest of praise where because there was a part of me that was a little bit worried. We're like, I love John of the Fox, but I don't know if it's necessarily the best Thin Lizzy album to start with because of all the the things we mentioned about not necessarily having the strong single, the rush production, kind of kind of some of the, the muddy sounds of the album. But uh, the fact that the this album was strong enough where you could get past those things. And you're like, I'm interested in checking out more is uh, hugely impressive. And I am very much looking forward to hearing like what you think of other albums in the catalog. So yeah, that's a, uh, yeah. that's, that's about as much of a win as you could possibly get on one of these. Mm. Um, <laughs> Steve, uh, this is the, the second Lizzie album you've done a deep dive into. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would you say it compares to jailbreak and just general thoughts on it? Uh, all right, and I guess you're looking at Black Rose right now, so you know that one pretty well. Right. I was just looking at it. I was like, I know like four songs off that album, and they're pretty good. Why are we doing these inferior Thin Lizzy albums? <laughs> uh, well, St. Patrick's Day and uh, Potato Famine. Uh, all right. And also because it, it it's Chris's favorite Lizzy album, and I knew he would offer some good insights. So I was thinking about what guests can I get? And so that's why it seemed like, you know, it's a good one. That's fair. Um, I think uh, overall, I think... You know, again, I th- and, uh, Thin Lizzy albums overall. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> ge- just general thoughts. Uh, so you can compare this to other Thin Lizzy albums. Uh, you, you, know, you mentioned how the band um, is more maybe consistent than Kiss. Yeah. So Kiss will have like some S rank songs for you and some Fs, and there's going to be a huge, there's huge peaks and valleys, and then Thin Lizzy. You're never going to get a song on Crazy Nights level, but you're also not going to get a boomerang either. It's yeah. all going to be like good, competent, consistent. Yeah, it's mostly it's mostly all like C's to A minuses. Where like I mean, honestly, there isn't the only Thin Lizzy song that really gets on my nerves is "The Boys Are Back in Town," and that's mostly due to the meta of the song rather than the song itself. Uh like Passville, Wisconsin sucks. Don't go back to town, boys. Uh, but I digress. I think well, oh, then REM is the band for you. <laughs> go back to Rockville. <laughs> um, I think like this this song, uh, this album has some 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 pretty decent standout tracks. I think the the top half of the album is pretty strong. The bottom half of the album is pretty forgettable, and I'm uninterested in it. Uh. So in in that regard, I I feel like I'm pretty pleased with the fact that I basically called the top half of the album in order uh, and got the bottom half of the album completely in the wrong order as compared to Greg, who did the opposite for the most part, other than don't believe a word. Um, Yeah, it's this album's not going to enter heavy rotation, but not the sort of thing that I go out of my way to avoid. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a weird 
Like, this is an album I think it's great, but it's not the album I would force upon most friends trying to get them into Lizzie. I think there are stronger places to start. Uh, but I, I, I think that it's, it's still good and it has a lot of merit. Uh, Victor, where can people find you online? Oh, they can find me at the Victastic K on Twitter and uh, under the name James Game Boy on Patreon, Spotify, and Bandcamp. Where can we find Pod you online, Chris? Uh, we're at podofthunder.com uh, on all the social media outlets. New episodes every Monday, except when Nick is sick, which seems to happen rather often. I'm trying to get him on a probiotic regimen, but so far he needs haven't had any luck. Yogurt. <laughs> he does. He does. He does. So, uh, so yeah, we're uh, next month will be uh, seven years that we've been at it. So, uh, still plugging along. So, if you haven't checked us out before, give it a listen. And uh, there you go. And Steve, where can people find us online? They can find us at LipstickGeneration.com and Lipstick Generation or Mr. Cool Rock and Roll on most social media platforms. All right, well, that's our episode. <laughs> Bye, Internet. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Lipstick Panel, hosted by Lipstick Generation. Lipstick Generation's music can be found on all major streaming platforms and at LipstickGeneration.com. If you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know your ranking of the subject in the comments down below. Feel free to leave us an episode suggestion also. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, please leave a review and tell a friend about our show. Thanks and rock on! <laughs>